Welcome to Slash Forward. I hope you have a stomach for brutality because we're going to take a bracing look at the colonial outback. After suffering losses so graphic I can't even mention them here, Claire goes on a journey to hunt down her oppressors and exact bloody revenge. But the unrelenting dangers of the wilderness oppose her at every turn. Any one of us probably wouldn't last more than a few hours, but we're gonna see how she does right now. Let's get to it. We open on Claire being awoken in the dark by her boo, Aiden, who wants to get in a goodbye before going to work. Once alone, she takes to the woods, singing sweetly to her infant, cuddly, cuddly. but always at the ready. She's a ruddy woman who doesn't just mend clothes and bring in the water, but also lays concrete like a teamster. Elsewhere, Sergeant Roos tries to get his men in order to prove to Lieutenant Hawkins that he's a big boy who can be trusted with big responsibilities. But they all look like shite and will have to spit shine each other's asses till they glow in preparation for Captain Goodwin's arrival. Claire is fitted and primped so the captain may be honored with an old British love song from their resident nightingale. The rowdy grunts quickly settle as the dulcet tones put a flutter in their hearts, a tear in their eyes, and a rush of blood to their groins. Afterward, she serves them drinks, looks, and just desserts. This is why Hawkins has taken a liking to her. So after he and Roos make some jokes about Goodwin's pension for buggery. He takes his leave to rest up for tomorrow's ass kissery and summons Claire to his room. He offers her some middling trinkets and demands she sings a song of butterflies to remind him of his mommy. She hopes this final song will earn her a letter of acquittal from this work release program. He demands outward expressions of gratitude and suggests, as an incel would, that the timing of her request is meant to make him look bad in front of the captain. Once he's established this, he leverages it to justify forcing himself upon her. The captain arrives just late enough to be useless, and makes a flaccid complaint about the men drunkenly firing their arms into the night sky. When Claire finally arrives home, bitter Harriet gives her the business, under the assumption she's been enjoying the attention of the soldiers. She then calls Aiden from his smithing so they can return home. Once there, they have a discussion about the status of her letter. She struggles to confirm its absence in a way that keeps Aiden calm, but she's also unable to hide the evidence of her abuse. He suggests they flee and attempt to make their own way in the country. But without her papers, the risk for her is far too great. With few options, he resolves to just ask Hawkins politely the next day. Claire then puts her new talisman with the others and goes to sleep. The next morning, while splitting logs, she witnesses the conclusion of Aiden's request on her behalf, which did not go well. Later on at the mess hall, the lieutenant comes in sour and sore from bending the knee all day. He sends the men away so he can have some solitude, but their raucous tomfoolery attracts the straight-laced captain's attention. Meanwhile, Aiden comes in the back for a more direct conversation. Let her go and they have a nuanced argument over whether the husband's rights or the property owner's rights should be prioritized. This causes Aiden to step up and Hawkins to have his boys interject. The end result is a brief scuffle that is ended by the arrival of the captain. The captain provides him a thorough dressing down and, given the state of his post, explains that he cannot recommend him for promotion to captain of the Northern Territory. I took on this post with the promise it would be one year. Three years later, I'm still here. Now a special little boy is all butthurt about broken promises of a temporal nature. How delicious. Due to his high impression of his own qualities, he vows to travel the hard road north to apply in person. He then immediately gathers up the boys and announces how they're all taking a dangerous vacation to help him realize his professional goals. To commence at dawn, Roos is tasked with acquiring some pack mules and a tracker post haste. Meanwhile, our young couple are making similar plans, but enacted too slow to avoid confrontation. Hawkins demands an apology, but in an ungracious way that forces Aiden to go for his gun in recompense. Once he's been disarmed and properly restrained, Hawkins spills the beans on what he's been doing to his wife. As if knowing wasn't enough, he then shows him right there. Everyone is stunned by the audacity, allowing Aiden to break free and attempt to keep his promise about the killing part. But when the men get their wits about them, they're able to peel Aiden off and Hawkins takes up arms to chip a little skin off his neck. This is pretty bad, but things get so, so much worse. And in the end, even young Jago has significant blood on his hands. In Dreamland, Claire and Aiden dance in top hats and petticoats, and then Claire wakes up alone in the pale light of morning to the fresh hell that is her life. She takes the evidence of what's been done to compel Harriet to reveal where the men have gone. She does alert the authorities. I can write up a report. 
who are willing to record the event for posterity. She tries to enlist the help of the other smithy, but he's just gotten his ticket and is not willing to risk it. But since she's set on pursuing the vile dogs at the end of the earth, he escorts her to where she can find a guide to help her through the bush. Billy is capable, but not looking for any trouble. She claims she's just trying to meet up with her husband, so it's all good. And she's willing to pay him two shillings, one now and one after reaching her destination unmurdered. As further security, one would have to be able to trade with a white merchant to convert the second shilling. This closes the deal, but leaves open some trust wounds to sort through along the way. They don't have to travel far for examples of the ongoing war raging for land rights, accentuating how dangerous the journey will be for both of them. After they've gone a ways, Billy notes the conspicuous absence of nourishment in his belly. But she was kinda hoping he would take care of that for them both. On the trail, his way involves seeking to acquire free surplus from local farmers, which she's not able to reconcile with her values, so they ride on. That night by the fire, as Roos needles the pack mules a little, Hawkins gets to wondering what might be on Jago's mind. And it turns out to be that terrible thing they all did the other night. Convinced that no one in their right mind would take the word of an unreferred criminal, he recommends Jago forget about it, both now and in the future, as referencing it again will bring with it significant punishment. Claire spends the night being haunted by the cries of her child, and they're awoken in the morning by a deluge. Once they reach full saturation, she figures there's really no reason not to keep traveling. Very quickly, she discovers why riding on horseback is such a disadvantage in the high country. Although the rain does help some in that the soft earth makes picking up the trail very easy. Claire expresses her eagerness to take the quickest pathway forward, regardless of the difficulty or danger. At times, in the lull, she's able to appreciate the beauty of the bush. But there's always a downside as she turns a corner into a chain gang of thirsty English cunnies. The headman insists on seeing her papers and wonders if she has any interest in tricking. She swiftly pushes on past them, demonstrating why riding horseback is such an advantage in the high country. She meets back up with Billy, who points out that he will likely be shot on sight, which would drastically limit his ability to guide, which means she has to arrange for her own self-security. Bruce hears a sound down by the river and returns to camp with a woman he found. Hawkins is inclined to leave her be and keep moving, but you know how he can be. It really doesn't take much to talk him into committing atrocities. Back at the trail, Billy finds their tracks and surmises they will likely catch them that very day, except they find the rains have caused the river to swell beyond her shores. Ever the sassy Irish lass, clear fords ahead and also happens to be the only one not to emerge on the other side. Luckily, Billy is willing to lend her a hand downriver. All this effort to live is her feeling pretty sleepy and hungry, enough so to do whatever is necessary. So Billy ventures in to seek out some fat back or some hard tack or maybe some corn pone, but the resident returns shortly and is mighty quick to pull the trigger. As Billy laments the difficulty of hunting due to his cultural assimilation, Claire tries to turn this into the oppression Olympics by recounting the unfortunate tale that brought her to this land, and failing to understand that her presence in this land is exactly why Billy's life sucks so hard. So Oh, checkmate. Feeling his roots, he sings the song of his birth name, Mangana the Blackbird. His hope is that, after dropping her off up north, he'll continue on to his homeland to find his mother. After finding a common interest in their mutual disgust of the English dandy, she then sings a song of her countrymen. Claire wakes up later to an approaching creepster. What are you doing here? Her? You're the English chimney sweep. Her powder is wet, but Billy comes through and they dash off. Then the next morning, when Billy helps to rearm her with some powder he stole from the farmhouse, they begin to build a tenuous mutual trust. Back with the boys, one of the cartmen takes a spear to the throat, and Jago gets his quad split down the middle. Once surrounded, the men attempt to barter for the release of Luana, but Hawkins can only see to use her as a distraction to cover their escape. In the rush, Jago gets separated from the group and struggles to prevent his leg from gutting all over the forest floor. This is helpful as Billy and Claire cross the path and find a nice clear trail to follow. But when they eventually catch up with and pursue him through the wilderness, he just will not stop running away from them. It's so annoying. Once close enough, Claire asks Billy to go wait with her horse, Becky, and goes on alone. She waits for him to surrender to make the shooting all that much more sweeter. But the second shot misfires, giving Jago the chance to show that he's still got a little something left in the tank. But it's not enough, as Claire takes the piss and coldly watches him wheeze out his final breaths. 
And then, of course, she cracks his face open with the butt of her gun. And is a little sheepish to discover that she has an audience. Oopsies. Elsewhere, Hawkins talks to Eddie and finds that he's got a little gumption as well. Questioning the decision-making ability of Roos, he offers to take Eddie up front to show him how to handle a pistol. After a bit, Uncle Charlie finds the ideal place to fork themselves as they're being pursued and no one takes the mountain pass. They travel upward for a while, but Hawkins is somewhat suspicious about this. He reinforces his need to reach their destination by tomorrow. As long as that's possible, they'll follow the mountain. Back at the split, Billy's really confused about the other group's travel choices. The mountain pass is really not recommended and impossible for the horse. He recommends they take the normal path and catch up with the others tomorrow. As Claire struggles in the aftermath of what she did, Billy agrees that if he ever found the white fellows that killed his family, he would probably do the same. The next day, we find the soldiers soldiering on. Charlie claims, to their relief, that what they're looking for is just over the next hill. When they crest the ridge, he welcomes them to the empty Northlands where they can be kings. He bids them adieu, promising to come check on them later. Knowing they need him to get out, Hawkins begins the delicate process of redefining the terms of their agreement. But when insult is laid on too thick, Roos becomes overzealous in defending his boss man. Due to this loss, Hawkins appoints Roos the new boy and gives him one day to get them out of there. And then he appoints Eddie the new sergeant, and with license to kill, congrats! Roos does his best to lead them out of the mist for a good several hours. When he gives up, Hawkins puts his life in the hands of a child, and Eddie blesses him with mercy like a big boy. Not far behind, the others find poor Charlie and take a few moments to memorialize his life. After this, they easily find the men. Billy devises an intricate plan that involves sneaking in from two directions, carefully putting down interlocking layers of confusion and distraction. Then, oh, well, Claire's PTSD kicks in and Hawkins wings her. She decides that she's done with this vengeful business, but she really would like to get the horse back, in remembrance of her husband. Of course, this goes poorly for old Billy in terms of getting caught. Luckily, they do still need him to help them get the hell out of there. So he now fills dual roles of knowledgeable guide and bottom rung of the hierarchy below Roos. They walk all night, and in the morning, to their surprise, they emerge onto the main trail. And they're so elated that they plan to celebrate by shooting Billy in the head. But young noble Eddie isn't quite British enough and aims a bit too high. This disappoints his lieutenant daddy, and he gets no second chance. Meanwhile, the mythical Mangana has crossed Claire's path and has shown her the way. She also emerges onto the main trail, where she runs across a pair of fine Christians who verify she's on the main road to town, which is hilarious when you think about it. She trudges down the road until a handsome madam grants her access to her caboose. She rests well until she happens upon Billy. They wander until they find a choice cottage to rob, which is free pickings because someone's already done it and left behind some sweet gear. This comes in handy by allowing them to blend in with the other junior imperialists. As they cross paths, Billy gets news that his people have been completely wiped out. The scope of the injustice sets the leader to despair and results in a casual mass murder. As they continue on, they eventually find another helpful pair of geezers who drive them into town and recommend they continue their ruse for Billy's safety. Here, they chance to run into Becky, and while reuniting, Hawkins strides right out and summons the constable to make an arrest in order to compel them to piss off. Seeing this as her chance, Claire follows him into the officer's lounge and confronts him with a series of vividly detailed accusations. He tries to brush them off, but they're so specific the boys aren't fully buying it. She drives the point home by singing them a song, because it's bad luck to lie in melody, so they have to believe her. That night before bed, Claire wonders if they ever have any shitbags like Hawkins in the tribe. Billy confirms it happens from time to time, but if they cannot be reformed, they're killed to prevent them from poisoning the whole crew. Claire then goes to sleep in full acceptance of Billy as a fellow human being. Claire wakes up alone with a sense that something is off, and rushes into town where she finds Billy preparing a bushwhacking. He slides up the stairs and takes care of Hawkins easily enough, but the screams of Hawkins' horror alert Bruce who manages to get a shot off. Billy now has about 30 seconds before he's reloaded. He uses all of that time to take it slow and make sure Roos knows what's coming, and then he gives it to him. Then they ride out and follow the river to the ocean. They arrive in Billy's homeland, where they sit and sing and watch the sun rise above the horizon. There's definitely some clarification needed for this one. The Nightingale clocks in at 2 hours and 15 minutes and is epic in its scope. 
It's filled to the brim with things happening to the characters along the way. I know that sounds like a general description of all stories, but I'm talking about a high volume of activities and constant changes in direction. When Claire and Billy were walking on the final road to their destination, there were about five plot points that each involved their own interactions and miniature conflicts. But anyway, The Nightingale takes place in colonial Australia. Claire, her husband, and a lot of the characters responsible for the hard work of cultivating this quote-unquote new land for Britain were prisoners sent over from various other locations. In order to get out of prison, they could be put into a work release program that converted them more into indentured servants. Once they had performed a sufficient amount of work to demonstrate that they had paid their dues, their benefactor could then write them a letter of recommendation that would allow them to update their papers and move freely about the land. This was actually one of the primary methods of maintaining control over these prisoners, who otherwise had full run of the area. Aside from the fact that the wilderness and nearly all of its occupants were incredibly inhospitable, white people who were clearly not aristocratic were constantly being asked to produce their papers for review. And you know these toady little grunts couldn't wait to find someone lower than them to put under their boot. So it was incredibly valuable to get this referral letter and very much worth risking everything for or taking extreme measures to ensure you don't risk losing it. Billy is a first-generation assimilated aboriginal. He was taken from his homeland at a young age before the proliferation of violence. This is why he still had some hope that he might be reunited with some of his family or community. He saw many of his family members get killed, but not totally annihilated. He was taken either by force or under duress, and under the auspices that he would be taught the ways of the white man to help assimilate into the new culture. These measures were taken to ensure the colonists would have a steady supply of obedient black people to do the worst jobs and help the pioneers learn about the land they were trying to cultivate. Once Claire has established her motivations, the remainder of the film focuses on bringing her and Billy together to demonstrate their equality while in the pursuit of those goals. In order to convince Billy to take her, she offered him two shillings, one up front and the other at the end. The second shilling was in the form of the jewelry Hawkins gave to her over time. Her assertion was that if Billy tried to convert them into money, they would be presumed stolen and he would be unsuccessful. In the end, Claire did take a brief detour to try to cash in on her blood baubles, and was refused due to the storekeeper's presumption that she had stolen them. This is a full circle on the themes of racism and acceptance involving the couple coming to understand how similar they were in various ways, and it really tempered Claire's innate racism that was on full display for much of the early part of the movie. She was constantly concerned that Billy would leave her or take advantage of her or eat her, among other fears. While they were never really on equal footing due to her whiteness, they were at least both second-class citizens due to Claire's Irish heritage. This was previously set up in several other scenes before this. Claire had been lactating and was in pain due to the lack of opportunity to relieve herself. Billy offered up some tribal remedies, which she initially declined, but when it became necessary, she gave in and benefited from doing so. Also, the final couple they meet on the road took them in town, they actually spend the night at that couple's house. In this instance, Billy feels the bitter sweetness of being treated as a human being in his homeland by the invading force. Finally, if it wasn't clear from the summary, the cathartic violence that she committed against Jago also shocked her. There were many evenings where she had nightmares and Jago became a recurring character in them. This caused her to waver in her desire to commit further violence. That, along with the reality of facing down your abuser, which, up to this point, had been mostly conceptual for her, is what caused her to freeze up and back off completely. The questionable aspects of this film go hand in hand with the positive, I think, so I'm going to cover them simultaneously. Essentially, this film did a really good job of giving us sufficient reasons for the characters' motivations. The stakes were definitely high, but then, due to character development that occurred from the lessons they learned along the way, their motivations and desired outcomes also changed, but in a consistent manner. We saw the full development of Billy not wanting any trouble and Claire being untrusting and racist, to Claire recognizing Billy as an equal, and Billy recognizing Claire as a community member, which is why he took up arms against their mutual enemies. There were lots of scenes throughout the film that brought all of this together. I think the primary weakness, however, is that it did this in a fairly unsubtle way that really hammered it home and ultimately resulted in the movie being so long. You don't have to show us all of these things in individual instances that serve as little side pieces to the main story. When they stayed the night with that final couple, the couple existed unnecessarily to take them the rest of the way to town. That wasn't really needed on its own and the entire night between, even less so. Certainly, there was some way to express this idea that actually fit into the story itself. 
If you build it into the overall progression, it flows more nicely and you can demonstrate the lessons learned in a more understated and nuanced manner. This goes for a lot of different things in the movie. One example is the instances of imperial atrocities. I have to be wary of my language on YouTube, so I won't be direct about this, but Hawkins was R-wording his way across the continent. The soldiers had to get blood on their hands, and their actions got me fully on board with anything the director wanted to do to them. But once there, continuing to drive this home begins to feel somewhat gratuitous. You can insinuate an R word pretty easily, you don't have to show it. I understand why you would, but the group scene happens shortly after the individual scene, and it involves killing an infant, and then there's another R scene later in the movie. This is the brutal reality of colonial Australia, and I get not wanting to shy away from that. But for instance, the wanton disregard for the indigenous population was shown when Hawkins used Loana as fodder to cover their escape. The scene of her degradation beforehand was rendered unnecessary by these later actions from a story perspective. To clarify again, I'm not saying none of these scenes should exist on their own. I appreciate an unflinching view of the colonizers, although the upper command does come out a bit clean in all of this. But the movie was 2 hours and 15 minutes. A movie doesn't have to be 90 minutes, although that is a reasonable standard given the three-act structure of most of these stories. If you go outside of this, you have to wonder to what degree it's necessary to do so, and it's not clear to me that directly showing multiple instances of R-wording is. Nor is the constant trekking, sleeping, nightmaring, waking up, and moving on portions of the film. It's just a bit repetitive and could have been just as effective by utilizing subtle implications. The net final impression this film is positive. I thought it was beautifully shot, and I enjoy a gritty, unflinchingly brutal western film. And there's something about those that are set in rural Australia that is particularly satisfying. The proposition is a good example of that. That said, this one takes a while to get through and is a pretty significant downer, so you'd have to be in the mood for that to watch it. Also, while it has a revenge-style motif and setup, it does not actually play out like other films from that genre. After all the stuff they go through, Claire takes the high road. Good for her as a person, but maybe she could have made him bleed a little? Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.